traditional super fun and all about artisan cheese and more to melt your peaceful heart and toast your peaceful life. Coming to you from the Appalachian Mountains of southwestern Virginia, this is the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hey, this is Scott Hall from Peaceful Heart Farm, and you are listening to the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hello, everybody. Melanie Hall here. Hope you are doing well. The conversation today and every day revolves around the value of tradition, traditional homestead living, traditional raw milk products, and artisan cheese. Topics discussed here are designed to create new perspectives and possibilities for how you might add the taste of tradition to your life. Fun facts about milk. Anybody up for some trivia? Fun facts about milk is my topic for today. We have fresh milk again. Because we have Princess Rosie's new calf. And it is always a treat. There isn't much milk at this point because Rosie is quite a small cow and it's her first calf. And I'll talk more about that fun fact in a bit. I want to take a minute and say welcome to all the new listeners. Welcome back to the veteran homestead loving regulars who stop by the Farmcast for every episode. I appreciate you all so much. And... I am really excited to share with you what's going on at the farm this week. And I don't know what it's like where you are, but spring is starting up here. We can still expect some colder days and our last frost date, according to the USDA, is April 15th. And that's more than a month away. Still, it is in the upper 60s today and sunny. In short, it's a beautiful spring day. Now, before I get into the animal updates, I want to let you know that I made a brand new cheese that I have never made before. It's called Reblicon. R-E-B-L-O-C-H-O-N. Reblicon. And it's actually still in progress. Uh, When I finish this podcast, it will be just about time to put it in the brine solution. Brining is a common method for adding salt to cheese. And I'm so excited about this cheese. It's a semi-soft washed rind cheese. Making it to the point of getting the curds into the mold was very quick and easy. The quick and easiest one I've ever made, except maybe camembert. But now the hard part begins. I've never made a rind with this much complexity. If I am successful, I will have created a creamy buttery cheese that will ooze and melt at room temperature, similar to the way that a brie or a camembert, a good brie or a camembert, it kind of oozes out of the skin. Now, the difference is here that <clears throat> there isn't that skin, that bloomy rind, mushroomy scent and flavor. This cheese will have a much firmer rind. Uh, we shall see how it goes. It is totally a new adventure. Now, let's talk about Some of our wonderful animals here. The sheep are out there milling about looking for every new blade of grass. And there is some out there. Uh, Sheep will eat hay, but they prefer fresh grass. Even in the wintertime, they're out there trying to find every little morsel. It's not readily available in the winter. And so they do uh, persevere with the hay. But any day, as I said, you're going to see them out there seeking at least one blade of fresh grass. And today, they are actually finding a bit. Now, granted, the blades of grass are few and far between, but there is a bit here and there. As far as lambs, these beautiful ewes have less than three weeks left before they start giving birth. We anticipate this event every single year. You just can't not love those little lambs bouncing around, jumping straight up and down in the early evening. Praying for this year to be as good as the last, we are looking for about six to eight healthy lambs. The cows, a couple of our cowgirls, are nearing the end of their gestation as well. That would be Claire and Cloud. We could see the next calf as early as two and a half weeks from now. In the coming days, we will begin to start walking the girls up to the milking shed every day. That reminds them of the path and what they need to do to cooperate with the process. 
Well, they also get a little treat while they are standing there. So that's probably their incentive as they really have no care for the process and cooperating with it. But they do like to have that nice little treat. Walking them up every day also is going to give us the opportunity to more closely monitor their progress, their general health, you know, any issues that we see, they're easily spotted, we can respond quickly. And I don't remember if I talked about this the last time, but we are looking at adding a couple of bred heifers or young cows that are bred and ready to deliver in April or May. Uh, we do have a line on some Nor Normandies. We'll see. I mean, it's not set in stone yet that we'll be able to make this happen, but it would help us out so much to get some much better dairy genetics. We're trying to build a specific genetic makeup in all of our cows. We need the A2A2 genetics for our fresh milk herd share members. And if you don't know what that is, I have a podcast called What is A2A2 Milk? So check that out. We also need the genetic trait for BB capacasein for making cheese. That's a protein, a specific protein that makes the best cheese. So we have lots of A2A2 cows, but we are missing the BB capacasein trait. And we're cheesemakers, so we got to get it in there, right? I believe that the only one who has that genetic trait is also not A2A2. So we'll be moving out those that are not A2A2. We have three out of our nine, I think. Um, and then uh, moving into the BB capacasein. So as we move forward, there will be significant changes in our herd. It'll take uh, the next five years or so for us to reach our goal of 100% A2A2 and 100% BB capacasein proteins. So that's coming up for our cows. The quail. I'm saving eggs to put in the incubator. I think I mentioned that we are giving the quail one more year to pay for themselves because these are expensive birds. Well, again, it's like people raise chickens because they're cheap. Uh, just costing a bit to raise these quail. So they need to pay for themselves. And so far, so good. I actually I actually have new customers that are, are buying the quail meat, and that helps a lot. The eggs sell fairly well, but there's little profit in eggs. Just saying. Try out the quail meat. And today I got the incubator down out of the storage area above the creamery. And tomorrow or the next day, probably, I'm going to crank it up. And the process of hatching those cute little quail babies will begin again. I think we'll probably do about four batches this year. In the garden, well, we aren't in the garden yet. We have preparing the garden is now on the agenda. Preparing the garden for spring. So I, I've got that on the agenda. Scott's going to help me out with that. And there's quite a bit to do out there, and these wonderful spring days are just the time to do it. I think beginning the tasks will be delayed a few days due to another project that I will talk about in a moment, but it's on the calendar. Did I mention that I have 500 bare root strawberry plants coming soon? Yeah, that's right, 500 strawberry plants. Scott loves jam and his yogurt, and I've been out of strawberry jam for over a year. And this year, I plan to remedy that problem. <clears throat> I'll have some yummy jam for you guys as well, if you like that sort of stuff. I have lots of tomato plant starts that are already sprouting. Also, the basil and thyme are sprouting. It's so good to be growing stuff again. And I'll have those at the farmer's market in a few weeks, six to eight weeks. Uh, probably the, by the first week of May, I'm going to have those pota potato, tomato plants uh, there. And the basil, the thyme, I've got some. Let's see, I have five different herbs, two tomato varieties, and eight varieties of pepper plants that I've got seeded. Um, and again, only the tomatoes and a couple of herbs have sprouted so far, but I'm... I'm actually amazed that those seeds sprouted so quickly. I've never seen any of my seeds sprout before six or seven days. And these came up in about three days. Something's going on right now in my growing area this year. Another example of that something going on in my growing area is that I have an amaryllis. Actually, there are three in that pot. And they are all over 13 years old. I've moved, uh, they have moved with me a couple of times and they've nearly died a couple of times. 
and, but they, they've always just been a bit of greenery sitting there. And for the first time in 13 years, one of them bloomed. And she bloomed big. There were three primary blossoms and one that was a little late in coming out. And that one is the only one left of the four right now. I watched that stalk grow for days and days and days. And then as it started to open, I realized that it had been so long that I had no idea what color the bloom would be. I thought for sure it would be a deep red. Nope, it was white. At this point, I'm thinking that the bulbs, the other bulbs might be even more than 13 years old. This one might be more than 13 years old, as I'm pretty sure that the last one I bought, which was 13 years ago, was red. Well, we'll see if any of the others bloom in the future. Maybe one of them will be red, and maybe after 13 years, my memory is just faulty on what color they were. Okay, the bees. I'm just going to do a short, neat note on the bees. I don't talk about them much. We don't give them a lot of attention. We've never robbed the honey. Uh, for quite a few years, they've simply gone on with their business of keeping up their hive all on their own. However, it's not looking good this time. We don't know for sure yet, but we may have lost the hive this winter. It was a particularly long and cold winter, and they may not have survived. We shall see. It was plenty warm enough today for them to be out and about, at least I thought it was. Uh, there are always a few guarding the door when they're out and about, and there there was nothing when I went out a little while ago. But uh, maybe it's colder inside the box, I don't know. I'll be very sad if we lose our bees. They pollinate our orchard trees and vegetable garden. And I'm sure they make yummy honey. We just kind of let them go on their own, though, and they, they take care of themselves and have for quite a few years. All right, let me go on to the creamery on a much happier note. The stairs to the storage area above the kitchen and creamery are currently under construction. What a blessing that will be when it's complete. It was quite the ordeal getting stuff up there to be stored. Scott attached this pallet to the front forks on the tractor. So he's got these forks like a forklift on the front of the tractor and he attached a pallet to it. And then we loaded up. Uh, loaded the pallet up with stuff and lifted the pallet up to the door. Um, a really, really tall ladder was placed at the door over the barn, like a really tall ladder, and Scott went in that door and then he came through the storage area over to the door over the kitchen and the creamery. And then, uh, so then he starts unloading the stuff off of that pallet. It was a little disturbing seeing him standing, actually standing on that pallet while it was suspended up in the air. But it held up just fine. Now, getting stuff back down got a little easier a few days ago as Scott set up the scaffolding just under the door. Uh, the scaffolding he'll be using to build those stairs. And then, so there's a ladder up to the scaffold, and then there's another ladder on the scaffold that goes up to the door. And so that made getting stuff down easier than it was getting it up there and uh, so we brought the stuff down to the uh, to the scaffolding and then I could just go d down the other ladder to the ground and, and actually just pull the stuff off by hand from the scaffolding but the stairs will make it perfect we just walk up the stairs get what you want walk back down and so on so that's happening on the creamery now let's talk about some fun facts about milk. Let's just talk about some milk. The first thing is following up on what I said a little bit ago about Rosie being small and this being her first calf. I said that right in the opening. Even had she been two years old, which is kind of the youngest target age of any cow to have her first calf, she still would not have reached her full size. All cows generally have a bit of growing to do, even after having their first calf at, say, two years old. Um, and they're going to produce significantly less milk with that first calf because their udder is still smaller than it will be when they reach their full height and size. So when you're planning your milk needs, keep that in mind. The first year, she will produce perhaps, I'm going to say maybe 25% less milk than her second and subsequent years. And the amount of milk produced by her with her second calf is much more of an indication of how much milk that you can count on from your cow 
from then from going forward. So the first year is always going to be quite a bit less than what you're going to get in the second and subsequent years. After the second year, though, they, they generally pretty much stabilize with that's about how milk, how much milk is going to be produced. Now, a huge factor for us regarding how much milk we can expect to be able to use is that the calves need to get their share. Any milk cow will produce far more milk than a calf needs. But that doesn't stop the calf from trying to drink absolutely as much as they can when given the chance. And every homestead and small dairy will have to manage how much milk the calves get. Calves get. Because after a while, after a few days, a month or so, all of a sudden your milk production really drops off to just about nothing if you don't do something with the calf. I mean, think about beef cattle. They nurse their calves as well, but they don't produce near as much milk. I think I read that beef cows produce about one and a half gallons of milk per day. A, a dairy cow is going to produce three to six gallons per day, you know, depending if they're first time, you know, they might only produce three gallons a day, but then they can get up to four, five, six gallons a day on our Jerseys and our, our Normandies. Now, if they're Holsteins, those cows are pushed to the limit. Some of them produce 10, 20 gallons of milk per day. But um, anyway, so we feed our calves one gallon of milk per day to start, and then we bump it up to two gallons per day as they get a little bit bigger. So we're controlling that, how much milk that they can get. They can't just drink every bit of it. We do that. We do separate our, our calves from the moms and then bottle feed them. So it is a rough three days, just three days, and then everybody adjusts and all are happy and content once again. Another method that we may try at some point is separating the calves from their moms overnight. We milk in the morning and then the calves get everything else after that. And then we pen them up at night and they can't drink the milk. They'll be just on the other side of the, of the fence from their mom. And then again, we take all the milk in the morning and then they get everything else for the rest of the day. I'm kind of hesitant to try that method as it is important for the cows to be milked out completely twice a day for the proper balance in the milk for cheese making. And I won't go into the scientific details, but making cheese is best done with a real consistency in the milk. So if we're actually milking twice a day and then pull out the milk that we want to give to the calves, then we've got a good consistent milk product for our cheese. And these are all choices that you make when you choose the homestead or the small dairy lifestyle. And I hope to help educate also that anthropomorphizing cows is not useful or any animal. They do not have anything remotely like human thoughts and emotions. I know we tend to feel for them as if they were human, but they are not. And the separating of the calf from the cow does not cause any lasting damage to the psyche of either the cow or the calf. It just doesn't. Three days, they're done. They go on back on about their business. Man was created to have dominion over the animals and the plants and the land. And must, we must do it responsibly. We, we must care for our plants and animals and, and their living environment. We must be kind to them. We must nurture them. But in the end, plants and animals and the environment are not human. And applying human emotions to them, it's just not, it's just not applicable. That's a little bit of a deviation from the topic, but it is an important point to make. Often I let my emotions get in the way and I feel bad for the animals on their behalf. And in the end, it's a useless pursuit. Uh, my method for dealing with this tendency, maybe, you know, if, if that'll help you out, it, it's I allow myself to acknowledge it, to feel it, and then grasp the reality of it. Removing a calf from its mother does not leave the same kind of deep and perpetual emotional scar for the cow and calf that losing a human child produces in us human beings. And that's what we really fear is that deep emotional scar that happens from losing a child. That does not happen with animals. It just doesn't. Okay, moving on from that topic. Oh, the amount of milk, there's a curve to the amount of milk that a cow produces. Um, when a cow comes into milk, you've got this production production curve that is pretty consistent. There are four phases in the milk cow's cycle. There's an early, mid, and a late lact 
lactation period, and then there is the dry period when they're not milked at all. In the early part of the cycle, her milk production will increase, reaching its peak in 60, 70, 80 days or so, and then the, the, the milk production begins to drop off, ending up just a little bit below where it started when she first came into milk. Then we, quote, dry them up. Basically, we uh, systematically stop milking the cow and she produces less and less milk. And we don't use this milk for making cheese. It stresses the udder just a little bit like you would if you were ever breastfed and, and you stopped. You know, there's a little soreness there and you can get a little bit of increased, um, oh, what do you call the um, activity in, in the uh, lymphocytes. And it, it can cause some really strange things to occur in an otherwise stable cheese making plan. So we don't use that particular milk in our cheese making. We will uh, still drink it. Uh, but again, it's the the, um, the immune system kind of, it, it puts a little bit of a load on the immune system just for a week or so as you're drying them up. Now, I talked about the amount of milk, but how about a little fun fact about the amount of cream? The amount of cream will change during the lactation cycle uh, the, the, as with the amount of milk. But the um, I tried to get some reliable information on the cycle of cream and I couldn't find any. And I surmise the reason is the same reason that standardization was instituted and now no one even thinks about it. Milk was standardized to have a specific amount of cream content. So the raw product, there's no statistics on the raw product of how much cream is actually produced at different times. But I know from milking them that there are times when there's more cream and times when there's less cream. So standardized whole milk in the grocery store is 3.5% milk fat. And then the milk is homogenized and that process keeps the cream suspended in the milk. In a fresh milk, the fresh milk from your cow the cream will rise to the top and separate from the milk. You can see the exact place in the jar where the cream stops and the milk begins. And this is known as the cream line. And it goes up and down during the lactation cycle because mom can control it. Uh, mom, she can control somewhat and even maybe hold back some of the cream for her calf. And uh, nutrition will affect the amount of cream. The, the point in the cycle affects the amount of cream. Uh, but the biggest factor in determining how much cream your fresh milk has is the breed of animal that you're milking. So 3.5%, that's a standard milk uh, fat that they can get from the Holstein cows, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. But the uh, Jersey cows are going to get upwards of 4.5%, even higher cream. Um, our Normandy cows are going to hang out about 4.5% cream. So you can see that would produce a significantly larger amount of fat at the top of the uh, milk than the Holsteins in their 3.5%. So before standardization, customers were getting varying cream lines in their, in their milk that was delivered to their door. I'm actually old enough to remember the milk truck coming at 4.30 or so in the morning and delivering fresh milk to the door. Uh, we lived in Michigan and in the winter... If you didn't get up and get the milk off of the porch, it would freeze and break the glass. And this happened at least once in my childhood. Anyway, to promote customer satisfaction, standards were introduced to ensure that everyone got their fair share of cream. Homogenization completely removed the cream line from memory, and it has become a distant memory. Now, let me talk about the Normandy and the Jersey cow cream. So I, I did mention that they have, again, they have a much higher cream, which is why we use them. Uh, the Jersey cows are a favorite in lots of small dairies and homestead settings, and they have that very deep cream line, again, far exceeding the 3.5% fat content on your store-bought pasteurized homogenized milk. I've seen our Normandy cows produce a cream line that was about two cups out of an eight cup half gallon mason jar. The Sometimes we get some Holstein milk and it will be, I'm going to say less than a cup, of, well maybe about a cup of milk. 
Yeah, about half as much of the cream that rises to the top. And even for the Jerseys and Normandy, sometimes there's more cream and sometimes less, as I said. But there will always be more cream in the jar of milk for, from our Normandy and Jersey cows than any Holstein cow. Holsteins, by the way, are the, are the black and white cows we associate with milk these days. It seems that every picture of a cow is one of the black and white Holstein variety. And perhaps some of you are as old as me and remember Elsie the cow. She was... Lots of fun facts here. She was the cartoon brand image for Borden Dairy from the 1930s all the way up to the 1990s when uh, Borden was bought by J.M. Smucker Company and the milk was rebranded Eagle Brand and Borden ceased to exist. Elsie was a brown cow. She was not a black and white Holstein cow. She was a brown cow. And when they decided to have a live Elsie appear at the World's Fair in 1939, the cow chosen was from a Jersey herd. You couldn't tell from the cartoon. I mean, she looked like a Jersey. She could have been a Guernsey. But when they actually produced the real live Elsie at the state or at the World's Fair, uh, she was chosen from a Jersey herd. She even had horns, just like the picture of Elsie. You probably don't remember the pictures of Elsie. But if you look up on the internet, Elsie the cow, you'll see the brown cow with the horns smiling at you. Uh, you don't see many modern pictures of milk cows with horns. And they do still exist all over the place. Holsteins, Jerseys, and our Normandies all can have horns. But it's all about the branding. Maybe, you know, it looks safer. Maybe, I don't know, that they don't have horns. And Holstein cows produce the majority of milk in the United States. And the pictures of the milk cows reflect that change, that they're all these black and white cows. But I still love Elsie. Now, there are flavors in milk that are affected throughout the lactation cycle. So the last fun fact about milk that I want to bring up is the unique tastes that pastured dairy cows bring to their milk. I can always taste the grass in the fresh milk from our cows well not so much right now as they're eating hay so it's it's not very strong it's a really good tasting milk uh, but when the grass comes in there can be a definite grassy taste to the milk or smell maybe it's more of a smell it's very refreshing in the spring when we are starved for green things i really really crave salad this time of year it's the only time of year that i crave salad i'm not a big salad eater but late winter brings out that craving in my body for fresh green things. So I really appreciate the grassy taste in the milk. Now, another fun thing that grows in the spring that cows love to eat is wild onions. And they're kind of a cross between onions and garlic. We actually have some growing uh, out there right now. Our property does not have a lot of wild onions, and I'm actually thankful for that. Unlike the grassy taste, the onion taste simply does not go well with milk, in my opinion. Now, however, it does make an interesting cheese. So there is that. So the grasses that cows eat change throughout the year. There are what are called spring grasses, then there are summer grasses, and there are fall grasses, and these are literally different uh, species of grass or varieties of grass. And then there is dried grass or hay in the winter. And so each type, each of these types of grass are going to affect the taste of our fresh milk and our handmade cheeses. So we have this lovely rainbow of flavors that happens over time. Now, the milk you get in the grocery store doesn't have that wonderful bouquet of aromas and flavors. Those cows are fed a very regulated grain or silage diet. They don't get to eat grass. Nope. Grains and silage. And all of this produces a specific milk flavor that is consistent. And there are no seasonal changes in the taste of the milk. And then there's that distinct cooked flavor of pasteurized milk if that is all you drink you'll never really notice it however if you drink fresh milk for a period of time and then take a sip of store-bought pasteurized milk you will definitely notice the difference it tastes cooked because it is my final thoughts for today 
We are eagerly anticipating the spring birthing of plants and animals. It is a wonderful time of year. My favorite time of year is spring. I know, I know, we're still 10 days away from spring, but I'm there. I'm so ready. Let me know if you enjoyed the milk trivia and drop me a line if you have questions or if I can answer any questions for you about milk, cheese, or any other dairy product. Love to help you out with that. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hop over to Apple Podcasts or whatever podcasting service you use. Subscribe and give me a five-star rating and a review. That helps in it show up more in people's search. If you like this content and want to help out the show, the absolute best way you can do that is to share it with any friends or family who might be interested in this type of content. Please let them know about the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. And thank you so much for stopping by the homestead. And until next time, may God fill your life with grace and peace.